The only reason that we see rise of price in an economy is when you had more money. I read the Kagan book. That's the guy who coined our very arbitrary hyperinflation definition that we have, which is 50% per month. 50% per month seems high, but it's even worse than you think. If you put it annually over a year, it's 12,000% per year. When you have a banana for two euros in the beginning of the year, that same banana will be 250 euros in the end of the year with 50% inflation per month, which is completely insane. People are dumping that money for anything else. Could be gold, could be other currencies, could be cars, could be any goods in the economy that is worth something. When that happens, you get to hyperinflation. The only thing that could trigger some kind of hyperinflation in the United States would be the loss of the world reserve currency. It's the illusion that the central bank can control the inflation. The money is made on debt. You have to create more money every year to pay the interest. 20 years ago, a house in my country would be worth $100,000. And now, Oh, it's six hundred thousand dollars. I'm gonna rush and spend all my money to buy goods. That's monetary substitution. That's the point where you get to high inflation. A two percent inflation per year for thirty years double your prices. You can keep fiat system working as long as the population accepts it. That's the origin of the world dollar. You have some artifacts, and I want to get to them also. If, if you have them, uh, do you yes. have them ready? Yeah, perfect, yes, perfect. of course. Of course, I, uh, I have them right, right here. I'm always sorry. ready. Everywhere I go, I bring this little, this little, uh, uh, little pocket, and uh, there's there's plenty of artifacts in there uh, from uh, yeah from from uh, Germany, from Ung uh, Hungary, uh, from some from Austria too. Um, and yes, basically I have uh, in my big collection here, I have uh, bills from uh, about near close to 40 hyperinflation out, out of the 57 official hyperinflations that happen um, in the world, everywhere in the world. Uh, so yeah, so I'm, I've been collecting those bills for about five years now. Uh, so I'm lurking, basically lurking eBay's, uh, eBay and every time I, I see... A bill with a lot of zero on it. I, I study the um, the period and the country where where it it, it comes from. It comes from and uh, and I add it to my my collection. Yep. What have you learned so so far from from studying all those hyperinflation currencies? Yeah, I finally learned what is hyperinflation because um, when we talk about inflation and hyperinflation, we always have a semantic or or definition problem you know so inflation for some people is like the inflation of the monetary mass which is basically the, the correct uh definition but we can't use that um if we talked about inflation um with economists or with uh, the layman because uh for them inflation is uh, the um the global well the the global rise in price in the economy which is the definition i use because um because it's the it's the effect that everybody sees so we can talk about the effect in its its cause um that what caused that we can debate on what caused the um the global price uh on 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 uh like on all the economy, the global ri price rise, sorry, in the economy. Uh, but basically, it's always uh, because of the, um, the the growth on the monetary mass. Because uh, simply, simply put, if if the price, ri if you have a fixed monetary mass, basically like like the gold standard, let's say, uh, it's, it was almost fixed. Well, like, let's say one percent inflation per per year because of the mining of new gold. So let's say it's practically fixed. So if you have price rise in some sectors of the economy, you, you will have, um, if the price rise here, the price will go down on the other sectors because there's not more money. You, the, it's uh, it's the, the, um, the, the, the purchasing power that people are losing because the energy is is uh, price are higher or, or I don't know rent prices are higher, they will lose it for other sectors. So they so I don't know the foods uh, they will will have less money for food. They will have less money to travel, and 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 all all those sector will will see less demand. So price are will will go down. The only reason that we see glow, uh, uh, general ri ri rise of price in an economy is when you had more money. So 
price go up in a sector and the price don't go down in the other sectors because people have access to credit. Uh, government create more money via, via money printing. So you add money to the economy. So every uh, price in the economy can go up and cause what we call inflation. Uh, so that's basically uh, what happened. If you have an energy shock, let's in like in the 70s, without adding money, you have price rise in everywhere you use energy and and, and, and other sectors will, will have uh, their price going down because it will be less demand because people will have less purchasing power. So that's how I, I can explain what uh, inflation is and why it's the um, rise uh, of the monetary mass that let it happen. If, if you don't have money, you won't have a general rise in price in the whole economy. It's impossible. It's mathematically impossible. It's not to say that if you fix the, the monetary mass, you won't have price rises and, and everybody would keep their persistent power. No, of course, if there's a energy shock, like in the 70s, the, the quality of living will go down because energy will be more expensive. Uh, but people will have choices to do and the money will go to the place where the price will rise and it will it won't go the purchase of power will go down and and you will see price going down in other sectors so it's some 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 bitcoiners say like oh if we have bitcoin we will have inflation yeah true we we'll we won't have cpi inflation because mm -hmm. um prices are not go uh, will not go up in general uh, in the, the whole economy but we can lose purchasing power if we have an energy shock or if we have a, uh, if the crops are destroyed by by bugs or by weather or whatever so so it's the the, um, the purchasing power thing still uh, exist even if you fix the monetary mass. Yeah, so that that was, that was my whole explanation. Sorry, I talk a lot, but uh, I that, that's the subject that that passionate me, and and it's hard to talk about that because it, if an economist from a, from um, a university hear me talking, he will say that's all bullshit. But I mean, it's super simple. You you get what I mean? Is if you have if you put more money here, you'll have less money for for the other sectors and. If you don't, if you had money, well, prices will continue to go up on every sector because the money is there. If you don't add money, you will have price rise here and pricing going down on the other sector. That that's it. That's how I explain what is the difference between um, inflation, price rise, and uh, loss of persistent power. That's that's the whole three concept right there. <laughs> I think uh, more and more normal economists uh, are waking up to that fact. Uh, it's it's like th they have a lot to unlearn. They they learned as a student in university that Keynesian economics. They learned then as a professor more. Yep. They studied in that. They are so deeply in there that it's really hard to get out there. And I have a lot of empathy for that. Mm. But I think they slowly start to get it. Like, like I, I, I really have a lot of hope for for that. That they also know mathematics and and, and simple logic, and they're like, yeah. okay, like it does, it's not does not work like that. And I think Bitcoin is the first really big thing that shows us that. Before Bitcoin, there was no exit wealth for that. So that's really interesting to see. Um, one question: You started so many have inflated currencies do you think that every currency that is controlled by a central entity will eventually hyperinflate is this an inevitability yeah uh, I've, in fact no uh but uh, that's what i learned from my research and i had to read um well at first i read the kagan book that that's the guy who um who coined um the ar very arbitrary hyperinflation definition that we have, which is 50% per month. And 50% per month seems, I, I, I know it seems high, but it's even worse than you think when you look at the 50% per month number, you're like, wow, 50% per month, that's big. But in a year, if you put it annually over a year, it's 12,000%, 12, 12,000% per year because of compounds interest you know how compound interest works so the, it's exponential basically so 50 uh, by 50 by 50 by 50 it's end up 12 times it's end up as a uh, 12 thousand percent inflation so it's way too high to describe hyperinflation it's way way too high i mean there was hyperinflation 
that happened uh, in some country that destroyed the currency and the country economy that didn't reach um 50% per month at all. I mean, there's basically two hyperinflation that happens uh, in the United States. Uh, first, during the uh, War of Independence um, in 1776, I, if I remember correctly. And then there was another uh, one during the Civil War. So that's that's a bill from the, the Civil War. That's the uh, Confederate bill. And this money, this is a $2, a $2 Confederate uh, from... Um, 1865, I think, or 1862. Anyway, so during the Civil War in the United States, and they, they had a month with 40% inflation. So they're not on the list, uh, but it, it, it was hyperinflation. Basically, the, the money was, was completely destroyed. And uh, I have a bill here somewhere. Uh, there it is. That's, that's a, uh, that's a um, um, colonial bill. Uh, from the United States be before it was United States, while it was a, a, a an England colony. Uh, so this is from Connecticut. This paper money and some paper money like that in in uh, well the Continental uh, bill. That's the money that appears right after this one. Uh, did hyperinflate to forty seven percent per month for while for during one month. So it's not on the list, but for me it's hyperinflation. So what is hyperinflation? It's basically. Uh, um, when you you get to money, you get to a point or where you get monetary substitution. That's the key. And what is monetary substitution? You, you ask me. Well, it's it's simple. It's when people are st stop using uh, the money and try to use anything else as money. So the money in hyperinflation are undervalued. That's really weird because y there's so much money. Well. It's because there's a lot of money, like at face value, there's a lot of zeros, but the money is undervalued because people are dumping that money for anything else. Could be uh, like uh, gold, could be other other currencies, could be cars, could be any any goods in the economy that is worth something. People are dumping the money. So while that while when that happened you get to hyperinflation because um, because of expectations. So the the money is undervalued, and as as uh, and while people are dumping the money, it's it's uh, always more undervalued, and it's a uh, uh, vicious uh, circle. How you call that in English? Sorry, it's a uh, you know vicious cycle, right? Vicious, vicious cycle, exactly. Yeah. And um, and you end up uh, with uh, a, a money that is destroyed. So your question was, can is can it happen to any currency? Well, uh, there's there's uh, there's like seven currency in the world that are sovereign, like U, um, U.S. dollar, Canadian dollar, uh, Australian dollar. Um, there's also a the Japan yen. There, there's some currencies like that that they are sovereign. So what is a sovereign currency? It's just a currency that it's just a country that can uh, 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 leverage his um, debt in his own currency. So Canada can do that. United States can do that. It's not all the country. It's just about seven countries in the world. So those countries won't go. It's 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 uh, hard for them to go in hyperinflation because when you get when you, you get a lot of inflation, uh, you start uh, to leverage your uh, debt in uh, other currency uh, because you have to buy to import things. So your debt will be denominated in another currency. So while your currency devaluate. You can't pay back your bet your debt because it takes more and more of your local currency to pay back your external debt. So that's one of the problem of hyperinflation. You don't get that if you're in Canada because we have we 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 uh, we have our debt in our own currency. So while our currency is going down in value, our debt is also going down in value. So you can fix the debt problem by printing more money. If you do that and you don't have monetary sovereignty, you're gonna kill the money. For sure, because yeah, your debt is going to be, uh, your external debt is going to be higher and higher and higher compared to the value of your money. So any country that doesn't have monetary sovereignty, that and and that have economical that like problem in their economy, can have hyperinflation because they will borrow more money from it, from other country to fix their problem, and their money is going to devaluate, and it will be a vicious cycle again, and they're going to end up 
with hyperinflation when the monetary substitution happened. That's where you get to hyperinflation. And it can happen way before 50% per month. That's, that's an arbitrary, arbitrary number that's way too high. And in Canada and the United States, <coughs> well, basically, uh, when you get into a debt problem, you just print more money, your debt uh, devalue, and you can pay it back with printed money. So that's a fix. But you'll get a lot of inflation in exchange. But you won't reach the monetary substitution. That's where you end up to hyperinflation. The only thing that could trigger some kind of hyperinflation in the United States would be the loss of the um, world reserve currency. Because all the, the U.S. dollars that are, are everywhere in the world, um, basically um, making the world economy, because that's the world reserve currency. Well, if we stop using that to make trade deals and buying uh, oil, uh, well, uh, all this, all those U.S. dollars will come back to the United States, and the size of the economy of the United States is way too small to accommodate all the U.S. dollars that exist today. So. It could uh, it could make a lot of inflation. I don't know. I'm not an economist. I could not do the the, the math to tell you if it would reach hyperinflation and monetary substitution. But that could be a big problem. Imagine that. I don't know. The, the, maybe the size of the world economy is like let's say let's say I don't know exactly, but three times the size of the the United States economy. Well, well, imagine that three times. Uh, well, the, imagine that there's three times too much money. You know, U.S. dollars in the United States, you'll end up with a lot of inflation. It will be too, way too much money in the system. So that's one way that the uh, U.S. dollar could reach something that looks like hyperinflation. But basically, to conclude, any country that have monetary sovereignty, it's hard for them to reach hyperinflation. And second, second part is that, let's say, Canada we have like natural resources that people want to buy. So there's, there's, there's always, there will always be some other country that will buy Canadian dollars to buy our resources, like, uh, uh, like wood, um, uh, like beef, like uh, wheat. We, we have those resources. And the example for that is the Zimbabwe. They had hyperinflation, but before they had hyperinflation, they were, uh, they were uh, producing a lot of uh, agro um, uh, product. You know, uh, uh, they had a lot of agriculture, there and they were exporting a lot. Something happened in the country that that breaks that, and that's when they got into hyperinflation because nobody would what were no external country were buying their currency to buy their goods. So that's what happened. They, their 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 money crumbled and they were they had to buy external debt to pay for to import instead of exporting. That's it. Will we then always have also fiat currencies when when in, when when there are certain types of uh, currencies that never hyperinflate uh, will they then always be there in 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 our system sorry i didn't get that you said if if uh, fiat currencies then yeah. will always exist also well i i'm i'm not sure um i'm not sure about that i mean well let's say the country that have real monetary sovereignty they won't they won't let that that power go okay they, they, easily i mean canada united states uh, japan japan's only work the, the country is only working because they have monetary sovereignty if if they wouldn't have that it would be they would be uh bankrupt you know they, they, they just create more and more money to pay their debt and they can't do that because they have monetary sovereignty they're as as much as they print their debt uh, value is going down because they're printing so they can they can survive like this a lot so they won't drop that anytime soon but any country that have a fiat currency that is not sovereign that that, that what that means is that they cannot uh their debt are in let's say us dollar th their their money might disappear we have a lot of um we have a lot of example of that we have uh, ecuador uh, ecuador uh that are is dollarized we have um El Salvador that is uh, dollarized. So those countries, when when they <coughs> when they reach a point that they are they have a lot of inflation, they have two choices: they create a new money, like uh, they did that in Hungary, they did that in Zimbabwe, uh, they did that in Germany. When they fix the hyperinflation in Germany, they create a new mark. That's it. Uh, France did that too. Uh, they had a lot of inflation at some point. They create the new franc. So that's one way to fix. Uh, I inf inflation or R inflation, 
or hyperinflation. And the other way is just to drop out the fiat and then dollarize and use the US dollar. So you stop inflation because you won't be the, the government in place won't be able to print the money to finance the government. That's that's what happened when, when you get hyperinflation is just simply because the government is using the printer, the money printing machines to finance the government. That's it. That that that's what happened at every in, in every hyperinflation. And if you dollarize, you stop that. The government cannot make choices uh and the choices of printing money. They just have to use what resources they have. Um and and that's it. That stopped the hyperinflation, basically. It's super interesting. By the way, I uh, next to you talking, I was uh, researching uh, like how detrimental a fifty percent inflation rate for per month actually is, and it's like I, I always try to make it um, uh, visible what, what that means. Uh, and I just did, did the math with ChatGPT. I hope it's it's not uh, not wrong, but I think it should be all right. When you have a banana for two euros in the end of, in the beginning of the year. That same banana will be 250 euros right around that uh, price point in the end of the year with 50% inflation per month, which is completely insane. Yes, <laughs> that this this happens and it's 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 like that's a high inflation rate. Yes, it is. And and in Zimbabwe, we have a lot of example of that. I read during my research, I read like three books or four books about hyperinflation in Zimbabwe. And two of them were, well, one of them was very, very interesting. It was a, a CEO of a retail store chain. Um, and was describing that at one point, the, the suppliers were um, didn't want to be paid 30, 30 days later, you know, because there was so much inflation that in 30 days, the money would work basically zero, like literally zero. So what they, what the suppliers said was that, okay, uh, we, you can pay in 30 days, but you'll, you'll pay the rate of, of, uh, the money that we, we, with the, the rate of inflation of in 30 days, but right now. So let's say you have a, a pair of shoes that is worth $4 million in, in Zimbabwean dollar. And, and the, with the inflation at that time, it would, in 30 days, it would, the money would, well, the shoes would be worth 70 million. So, so the inflation rate right now is, is the shoes are, are $4 million dollars in 30 days is going to be 70 so the supplier will charge 70 million right now so instead of selling the shoes right now for let's say 20 million the the store have to to sell the shoes for let's say 150 million so the anticipation of inflation accelerates the rate of inflation uh that's why i said the money uh, earlier i said the problem with hyperinflation or high inflate very high inflation is that the money is undervalued that's an example right there on why the money could be undervalued is that you apply the inflation of the next 30 days to the price right now because of your supplier uh, won't accept to be paid 30 days later. And you say, well, they just have to pay right now. They will say, well, that's not how business works. The, 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 the CEO there didn't have the liquidity to pay uh, up front for the shoes. He had to wait to sell the shoes and then pay back the supplier. So this logic there in hyperinflation can't work. So you have to include the, uh, the inflation upfront in the price so it caused a vicious circle right there again it's super interesting even in <laughs> uh, because um my, my podcast has sponsors and and i also we usually do like two three four five months periods uh and this is even like if you if 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 both are kind of Bitcoin companies and both have uh, like I have my treasury of course in Bitcoin and they also have part or most of their treasury is in Bitcoin, uh, then the point of payment is way more relevant <laughs> than, than it, it used to be. I I came from the fiat world in IT security, sold IT security uh, services. Inflation was only a, a topic to discuss if the contract was over one year. So mm -hmm. uh, I remember negotiating for a really big uh, five-year contract around like a half a million uh, volume. Okay. Their inflation really was a topic. Of course. Uh, because uh, there was like a service we had to bring in five years. <laughs> and 
they have now a fixed price, but only pay in, 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 in yeah. uh, five years time. Yeah. Maybe this payment doesn't pay the employees that bring the service then. So, uh, it, it's really funny how, how, how these things come together already now. Imagine in a high inflation scenario. Yep, exactly. And, and that's why economists says that inflation is not a problem. It's we can forecast it. That's one of their point. And they're, they're kind of right. If, if the contract forecast the, let's say, 2% inflation, that's, that's not really a problem. But the thing is, is, it's the illusion that the central bank can control the inflation. That's basically an illusion because in, in the, the, the 2010s, they, they were trying to reach the 2%, but they were not even reaching it. They were saying that we don't have enough inflation. They were basically telling us we're, we're going to have to revise our, our, our targets higher because we're not even able to reach the 2% inflation. And, and for all your viewers, the central bank role is not to control inflation, not to go to I. The, the, the central bank role is to create some inflation, at least 1%, so your house is not worth less every year because in in a in a normal economy with a fixed uh, uh, money uh, money supply, you would get deflation. It's 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 normal. You would you would get deflation because population is growing and the the the, the, the countries are producing more. If you don't put more money in the system, everything's gonna uh, uh, the price are gonna are going to go down, and that's normal. But because of the the crisis of uh, the, the the 30s, people are scared of deflation. They don't understand it very well. They always identify that as a like in a credit uh, bubble burst, like in the the 30s, well 1929. Um, but basically, a growth deflation is 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 normal. It, it did happen in the 19th century. In the 19th century, we had the gold standard. And we had deflation, growth deflation. So, so all that to say that the role of a central bank is not to limit the inflation, like at at, at let's say two percent. It's to reach two percent, so the whole um, financial system don't don't go go down. Because imagine that the house of every person in in the world going down 1% per year in price it would not work with our current system in our current system because the money is based on on debt you have to create more money every year to pay the interest that's normal i mean i'm what what i mean is that is i'm not for that system but what i mean is they have to create more money to pay the interest because every dollar that is created is a debt you have a percentage of interest applied to it so in our current system you have to create inflation for the system to work. But that's not to say that for an economy to work, you need to add inflation. No, in the fiat system, yes. But in, the, in a, let's say in a gold standard, you don't have to create inflation for the system to work. You're going you're gonna to end up with a deflation. And basically, in the whole history of the world, um, the price were very stable. Like if you go back to Roman time and, and uh, if you go in um, medieval time, prices were very stable. And there was one part of history that is called the great, uh, ah, sorry, I don't remember it in English, but um, there, there was a, a part of history uh, when the, uh, the Spaniards went to um, uh, Americas, discovered the America, well, not discovered, it was already there, but uh, you know, when they went to Americas and, um, and they brought back a precious metal they created inflation in Europe, and it's called the great price, the great the price revolution. And basically, the price changed for one percent per year. There, there was an inflation of one percent per year, and it was called price revolution because the price didn't change back in those days. Why? Because of gold. The gold uh, was uh, had a one percent infl natural inflation uh, because of mining every year, and it was about enough to compensate for the population growth and, you know, uh, more product, more productivity. So the price were very stable. And when the Spaniard discovered all the metal, the precious metal in Americas, they disrupt the whole price system there. Uh, and it caused um, a, um, a period that was called pr the, the price revolution. So basically, if you don't, you don't have a bank, central bank creating more money and you have a, a a, a monetary system that is kind of fixed, fixed. Sorry. Well, 
uh, you, there's no reason you have price increase. You, you, sh you should have price uh, deflation, basically. That's, that's the normal thing. And then people will say, well, what, what will we do with the salaries? Of course, at some point, salaries will need to go down, but your purchasing power would go up. So I don't know if I get 10% more purchasing power uh, over, let's say, five years. It's okay if I get a pay cut of five percent. You know, you, you're 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 you have more processing power. The nominal number doesn't matter at all. I mean, houses five. I don't know. Ten, sorry, twenty years ago, a house in my country would be worth one thousand, one hundred thousand dollar, Canadian dollar, and now it's six hundred thousand dollars. So it's the same house. So the nominal price doesn't matter. It's the, it's the thing you can buy that matters. So, so what it means is not that the house is better. It's just that the money's got devaluated. So the nominal number doesn't matter. It's just what you can buy, the things, your goods you can buy with your persistent power. That's what matters. So if you, if your money is when, if your money is worth ten percent more, imagine all your, your, um, the money you have saved is worth is worth ten. 10% more and you get a 5% pay cut, that's fine. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made a perfect Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect, subtle, elegant way to go out there and show that you are a Bitcoiner. And that watch brand is Bitcoin only. And Coin Vigilante just dropped a completely new and amazing Genesis edition of their watch collections. You have the date of the first ever mined Bitcoin block in there and of course also the block height and which epoch we are currently in. I love the level of detail they put in in this masterpiece and make sure to check out those amazing coin vigilante timepieces down in the descriptions. I love those watches so so much. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis I guess you already bought some Bitcoin and now the most important step is is to keep the Bitcoin. Keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code ROBIN at the checkout. Visit bitbox.swiss ROBIN to get your Bitbox. And the next step is to really level up your sovereignty as an individual. You have to have the most secure self-custody setup. You have to secure your own devices. You have to protect your privacy. You have to set up an inheritance plan. And depending on where you live, you even want to have a plan B, a citizenship where you can move in case something goes really, really wrong. And through all those steps, the Bitcoin way is guiding you through step by step. And if you visit the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you even get a 30 minute free call to find out how you can level up your sovereignty. Absolutely. And uh, I just looked it up because of, it's all over Twitter also. Um, pro, it, it's a new all time high for Bitcoin in, in Canada right now. So it's reached the first time ever the over 100,000 yeah. per, 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 per coin, right? In, Crazy, in Canada. Right? Yeah, we reached the. Uh, the, uh, the the magic number of uh, one thousand k per per bitcoin. So so yeah, it still need you still need six bitcoin to buy a house in in Canada. So so maybe I don't know. Maybe in five years it's gonna be uh, I don't know a two bitcoin, three bitcoin, one bitcoin. I don't know. So that's 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 how you can measure. Uh, well, bitcoin is kind of deflationary. There is still there's still inflation because we we mine more Bitcoin every 10 minutes, right? But uh, it, at, at some point it's going to be fixed. So so it's normal that um, that things will be uh, priced, things priced in Bitcoin uh, will will go, the price, price in Bitcoin will go down because, uh, well, because we have more productivity, more people and, and, and Bitcoin is, is limited. So exactly like the gold center was in the 19th century, there's no reason that uh, the price of things, uh, sh well, price of things should go, should go down when they are measured in Bitcoin. Yeah.
I, I love measuring things in Bitcoin. It makes the world seem to be, oh yeah, everything is getting cheaper. It, it's a really positive outlook, but it's also funny with the salary. I, I actually talked about that on the other podcast with, with someone who asked me, what is the most unexpected thing that will happen on a Bitcoin standard? And I was like, people are not ready to have a salary cut <laughs> in nominal yep. terms. They will have a real, they, they will have more purchasing power. It's a funny thing. People uh, probably um, like it more to have less purchasing power, but more nominal than the other way around, which yep. absolutely makes no sense at all. It makes no sense. <laughs> uh, but that's a human that's a human brain for you like that that's that's uh, that will be an interesting time if because i already i'm i, I will measure that uh it's my first year of podcasting uh, i get uh, paid uh in in bitcoin but i also get paid in in fiat because yeah youtube and, and twitter is not paying me in bitcoin yeah. uh and I will convert everything uh, in Bitcoin and say like, okay, that's how many Bitcoin I earned in the first year of po podcasting. I think it will be really hard for me to grow my income in Bitcoin terms over the next five to 10 years and grow, mm. have the same income no. in 2034 than in 2024. That will be that if, if I achieve that, I achieved a lot of things. <laughs> Yes, of course. Yeah, of course, you're going to, for your project, you're, of course, going to get a pay cut in Bitcoin, of course, because I don't know the price in, of Bitcoin in five years, but uh, if it continue to go up like is it's doing right now, well, I mean, uh, you would be really rich if you get paid the same amount of Bitcoin that you're paid right now in five years, in five years, of course. It motivates me. I, I, I want to have the same income in 10 years as I have this year. <laughs> Perfect. Let's try that. <laughs> yeah, because, well, yeah, well your see. channel can grow, basically. <clears throat> so it is possible that it is possible that you get the same amount of Bitcoin in five years or 10 years, but you will have to grow your, your channel, right? That's, that's the thing. That, that's perfect. I, I, I hope you get it. <laughs> Probably one advantage that I have is that my channel is about Bitcoin and that my channel gets more interest when Bitcoin uh, is also getting more interest in the general yeah. population. So uh, maybe I have an effect there, but uh, let's see. That's a virtuous <laughs> cycle there. That's perfect. I like that. <laughs> it, That's it's, virtuous. It's, it's, a, it's, a, um, uh, it, it, it's a, it's a loop. Yeah. Really yep. cool. Uh, but back to the topic of, of hyperinflation. Yes. Um, when, when you measure, when, when you see all those studies of like currency that's, that hyperinflated and we talked a little bit about it before, but, um, is there a, a metric, an event or like the, the, the tipping point between normal inflation yep. and Oh shit, we have hyperinflation. Yes. The tipping point between uh, most people say, yeah, it's annoying that the prices rise, uh, go up a little bit. And like, oh shit, <laughs> I cannot afford anything right now. And yes. I will rush as soon as possible uh, and get everything that I can buy. You're describing it. That's exactly it. The point where you, 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 you go from normal, let's say <laughs> normal inflation, that can be quite high, you know? Let's say 10% inflation is not high inflation. Okay. Uh, it's, it's just like, um, moderate. It's called basically, technically it's called moderate inflation and moderate inflation doesn't mean it's low inflation. It just means that the, the economy and the people can tolerate it. Okay. Annually. When, sorry. Oh, Annual. I, I, when I say 10%, it's annually. Yeah, yeah. It's annually. So, so moderate inflation is basically just, um, psychological thing that, that you just mean that the economy and the people would, would, would tolerate it and not reach the point that they're going to be monetary substitution. So what you described there is say, oh, I'm going to rush and spend all my money to buy goods. That's monetary substitution. That's the point where you get to high inflation. So hyperinflation and high inflation is exactly the same thing. It's just hyperinflation is 50% per month because of the Kagan guy that coined that. And basically why it's 50%, it's so so simple. He studied seven hyperinflation and the three lower hyperinflation that he studied out of the seven was 50%, about 50% per month. So he said, in his conclusion said, well, when it reached that, it, you can come back from hyper you, you cannot fix the when you reach 50 percent per month hyperinflation cannot be fixed by normal means you have to uh change the currency or dollarize okay so so that that's that was his conclusion so that's why he coined it the 50 percent 
uh, per month. But if he had studied the hyperinflation that happened in the United States um, in the 19th and the, the 18th century, he, he could have uh, put it at 40%. You know, just that he didn't he didn't study those those period. Uh, by, 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 back in 19, he did that in 1956. And there's another guy that studied that more. <coughs> he studied about 30 period of uh, moderate high and hyperinflation periods. It's called Bernal's. And uh, that's where I learned uh, most of what I know about hyperinflation because before that, it was a mix of uh, like the Kagan books, some books I've read about hyperinflation that happened in some countries. It was it was a, a great empirical, you know, knowledge that what happened there. But I, I could not, if you ask me, me a question, what is, uh, what's the tipping point of hyperinflation? I could not really explain it to you. But when I re read Bernal's book, it was super clear. It was just the monetary substitution theory, things. And to make it even more clear, When the, they, they had hyperinflation in Weimar, okay, Germany, uh, uh, after the first war, the first world war, sorry, there was a high inflation or, or um, well, a lot of inflation in France too, because France was printing a lot of money too, because they, they suffered the war too. So, so basically, why there was uh, hyperinflation only in Germany? Because of monetary substitution, because people were, were dumping marks for franc and The franc was a lot. They had a lot of inflation too in France, and the franc was a money that would devalue a lot, but just in less compared to the mark. And that's why the mark had hyperinflation because people were just dumping the mark to buy franc, to buy pianos, to buy anything they could buy in on the market to uh, to save their possession power. So and um, and and the French people were, were doing that a bit less. And that's it. That's the only explanation of why um, uh, Germany had hyperinflation back in, in 1923 and not France, because uh, f the people from uh, in France were not dumping the currency uh, as fast as the German. And that's that's the tipping point, basically. For, for me, interesting is that you said that uh, not all currencies have to have inflate, that... That, that's really interesting for me because I always thought actually that once you have inflation, you have to pay the interest in that and there will come emergencies. And that's why they, they keep inflating. And with every time they inflating a little bit, next time they have to inflate way more. That's like the, that's why I like this, this exponential M2 growth, like this, yes. this, this crazy charts where I'm like, yes. okay, what is that? I want to invest in that. <laughs> yes. But, but there's, there's no problem with that. Let's say, look at the, all the um, Latin American countries, uh, their bills have a lot of zeros. I mean, if you go to Mexico, uh, 50,000 pesos bills, Uh, won't buy you anything. I, I don't have the, I mean, I don't have the the exchange rate in, in mind, but they 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 added zeros in the 70s and the 80s because they had a debt crisis at that time, and um, the government was able to borrow a lot because of low interest rate. Or uh, no, 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 in the 70s and the 80s there was there was high interest. There's 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 something that there, those in those days those countries were getting more. Um, They were getting more serious or something, and and some countries around the world wanted to uh, lend them money, something like that. So that's, that's what I read. So they 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 accumulate some debts and that they were not able to uh, to pay it, and uh, that's a debt crisis that happened there because of that. And they printed money to get out of the the debt spiral. So so they fixed the problem by devaluating their money. And if you add some zeros and and you don't reach the monetary substitution. Uh, uh, switch and and you, you just devalue your money and and the people tolerate it well then you can stabilize the inflation after at two percent and you're you're going to be fine all the uh, latin american countries did the, had this same problem and actually the the mexican pesos did perform well uh in the last few years compared to the u.s dollar and i guess it's because they didn't they just didn't print as much as the, 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 the US dollar, the, the Americans did. So it just means that if you don't print too much money, even if you printed a lot of money before, you can be fine. That's just um, basically, if you don't finance your country with money printing, you can have fiat money for, for, for the eternity. It will work 
Uh, but you had just have to keep in mind that a 2% inflation per year for 30 year double your prices. So your price will double every 20, 30 years. And that's it. At some point, you're going to add a zero to, to the bills. And that's it. That, that's what happened to the franc and the new franc in France. They had bills like uh, 50, 500 francs. And whoop, they switch, they redenominate. They call the new franc. They remove some zeros. And then one franc back in the 60s was worth like kind of a lot of money. Like, I don't know, maybe, I don't know, let's say $10 today, 10 franc today, or maybe 20 franc today. But it was one franc. It was a, it had a purchasing power. And and um, let's say uh, at the end of the franc era, because now it's euro, uh, but well, the franc had a very lower purchasing power than in the 60s, but it was still some francs. And you would, would just need 10 francs to pay for what you were paying one franc uh, at, at, at the time. That's it. You just add zero very slowly. So no, so in my view, you can keep fiat system working as long as the population accepts it. Accept it. That's it. For me, it sounds like it's a lot about about trust. Like as as long as the population has trust in the currency, they can actually print even a lot. As as long as the people uh, think it it has some value. Yeah. yeah. You um, you may be right, but not a lot. There's there's a point that it it shows in the economy because because if you had if you flood the economy with money, some some economic principle will make the price go up because people will overbid uh, each other. So it will. But you're right that you can still print some level of of money. That I don't know I don't know the exact tipping point. Oh well, actually, we print in in um, Western countries. We print basically six to seven percent more money per year, and we measure two percent inflation. But we still had six to seven percent more money to the system every year, and and people are okay with it because they, they didn't feel it that much uh, in the in the last few years. Now we're feeling it more. So uh, and and what I wanted to add basically is that what you're saying about trust is it shows so much with the solution of hyperinflation what i mean is that you can have a um you can create a new currency in a country that is very solid and fail i mean people won't trust it and you can even have a brand new currency that is based on nothing just ideas and 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 talk and so just just bullshit but if people believe it it will it will fix hyperinflation and inflation just because people are trusting and accepting the money. So what I mean is that you can have a perfect solution that doesn't work because people are not trusting it, and a shitty solution that works just because people are trusting it. So it's just the way. Uh, basically, I guess you're you're better to have a, a good solution that people accept, but it just means that a good solution can not work and a bad solution can work. It's just based on the trust of the people. Super interesting. I mean, to the point, I think like if, if you print a lot, you probably lose the trust. So that, that, that's also also one thing. Yep. Um, the, the thing I wanted to allude to is like, w what if this positive Bitcoin mind virus <laughs> that, that, that got me and hooked and that probably also got you hooked and, and some of the list and probably most of the listeners also uh, spreads where they, they, they don't trust the euro anymore they are like 100% outside of 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 the euro what if that spreads in in, in the whole society and the trust completely gets lost in 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 in, in the currencies that then it's also have inflated or what super easy to explain it's the let's take the example of the monetary uh, world uh, sorry the world reserve currencies <coughs> that we had in the last 500 years it started with uh, Spain, uh, with uh, the well. Actually, I have a well. Let's 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 begin the uh, artifact showing. That's a real uh, Spanish dollar, basically. That's uh, that's uh, eight real real. So it's piece of eight. So it's uh, from Spain. This one is uh, 18, 1814. 1814. That's a real Spanish dollar. So so that's where come. That's where the 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 U.S. dollar comes from. A U.S. dollar is this exact same size. That's I'm I'm going to show you it's it's 
it's super interesting. And I, I'm going to continue about the oil reserve currency after, but you're going to all know now where the U.S. dollar comes from. So that's that's the size of a real U.S. dollar when it got implemented in the 1792. That's a modern one, but that's the size of, of silver coin that it was at the time. Let's compare it to the Spanish dollar. It's the exact same coin, you know? So the U.S. dollar, the, the, the meaning of a dollar is that. It's about $25 of, well, maybe $20 of silver right there. So basically now it's just worth almost nothing. You know, a dollar is not worth much. But back in those days, a dollar was worth at least $20 of silver, basically. Okay. Wait, wait. So, uh, so, uh, hang on for a second. I just want to make it for the listeners that don't have the video <laughs> because there are, oh, yeah. I have the video everywhere where I can get the video too. So like Spotify has the video, YouTube has the video, okay. X has the video. But for those who maybe listen on Fountain or on, on Apple Music or something like that, uh, they can yeah switch over to, to Twitter or YouTube or whatever they, if, if they really want to, to see the coins because I think it's really interesting. Uh, and uh, I love the, that you have the, the whole collection <laughs> uh, yes. here. Uh, and I think th that's one of the, I, I usually keep it uh, also listener friendly, but I think that's one of the rare instances where you might want to switch over to Twitter or you switch over to Spotify or YouTube or somewhere and then actually see see the stuff that's going on. So, but sorry, continue. <laughs> yeah, cool. So, so I'm going to describe it a bit. It's so so those coins are about, uh, let's say, three, three centimeter um, um, large, let's say, one inch and a half in, in uh, diameters. Uh, and yeah, they, they're, they're, they're worth about uh, 20 or $25 of silver. So that, that's a real word of uh, original dollar. So what I'm showing right here, it's a dollar. So that's the origin of the world dollar. It's it, This one is an Austrian one. So the uh, Austrian Netherland uh, in uh, 1793. So that's that's the origin of the world dollar. It's a dollar. Dollar means valley in uh in german right wait 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 uh, uh the word dollar comes from austria well uh not no not austria some 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 region of uh germany i think where there was, there was a mountain full of silver and there's a guy called joachim uh i think it was called joachim who was uh uh minting those coin and that's one of the um that's one of the well he coined the the world taller the word taller in the size and then a lot of countries used the taller denomination so austria had their own taller uh, right there oh, so this one from Thaler, interesting. Like th there's this german word taller or so okay. uh and I, I never wow Interesting. I, uh, oh, that's that's that is for me. It's really interesting because I'm German speaking, uh, and there's this word uh, "taler" uh, that is just used as as like a, as as a coin, uh, especially like in comics in the early when I uh, was uh, watching the the comics yeah. as a kid. The, this word was really present there, yeah. uh, and this is the origin of dollar. Yeah, I just like Google it, and now it came up again. That that's pretty. I, I, wow. So, so basically, this coin from Austria, 1793. That's Austrian Netherlands back in those uh, those days. I guess it was the uh, Habsburg or the uh, you know the, the 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 Austrian. It was not the Austrian Empire anyway. So it, I guess it was some Habsburg people that coined the, um, the this this particular dollar. But there was a lot of dollar in a lot of countries in Europe, and you have. Uh, the uh, Spanish dollar that about the same size uh, right across. So about, let's, let's say, three or four centimeter of uh, diameter. And and at the end, you have the U.S. dollar right there, the original size of a U.S. dollar in silver. So that's that's what I wanted to show you. So back to the, um, the world reserve currencies. So we had the uh, Spanish dollar in the, when the... Um, the, the the Spain was a superpower. They went to to Americas. They had a lot of uh, power in in Europe, and then um, the first central banks was founded in Netherlands and Amsterdam. So so all the um, the world uh, commerce uh, migrated to uh, Amsterdam. So it became the world reserve currency. It's a it's a golden. I have I have it right here. I have a golden. I have everything basically of. Uh, the history of uh, 
of world reserve currency. So the golden red there, it's not a it's not a great piece because uh, I didn't pay that much. So basically, it's a bit smaller, but it was a a silver coin also. Uh, but the the cool thing here is that uh, it was not the silver coin that was a reserve currency. It was the the scriptural money in the books of the Bank of Amsterdam. So it was some account accounting money, you know, on um, on ledgers. So that's 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 when uh, the switch were made uh, between the world reserve currency from Spain to the Netherlands and then uh, England and then United States uh, after the first world war. So basically what I mean here is you, you're saying, so um, when people uh, don't trust the euro, they, they might choose something else. Well, it did happen. Uh, um, it did happen. Uh, like at least five times in, well, four or five times in the 500 years. And you know what? What's really interesting here is that the Spaniard were not devaluating their um, their Spanish dollar. They were devaluating the money of the people who was Maravedi. That's a Maravedi there. Here, right there, it's a smaller coin, a copper coin. And you can see that on the camera, but there's a number step on it so basically the government will recalling the coin and stamping new uh denomination on it so they will call uh, all the coin of people and stamp a two on it and then a four and then an eight so they were doubling the monetary mass like that so at one point i guess that uh that uh well they were doing that because they want to transfer the inflation to the population and not devaluate their world reserve currency coin that was used by the world commerce if they were doing, if they, they were devaluating their their Spanish dollar, they would lose the the the, the world reserve currency status, and they they devalue the money of the people instead. So what <laughs> what is important to understand here is that all those monetary world reserve currency were uh, were not touched by devaluation until the people choose another currency, or maybe if they began to devaluate it, people were choosing another currency because they had the choice and. The United States is basically the first superpower to devaluate the world reserve currency. Why? Because they can. Because they they impose their power. They have an hegemony in French. I'm not sure what's in English, but I mean they they are the world superpower. They can impose their currency for world commerce with, uh, with oil. Let's say the petrodollar is a good example. They impose their currency for the trading of oil. So that. So, so people don't have a choice to use their money to to make um, contract for oil or um, other uh, like big big international deals. So basically, that's why they can devaluate it, and people don't have the choice anymore for their money. Before Bitcoin happened, basically, because now people that individual can have choice to to opt out and choose Bitcoin. But what I'm what I'm saying here is before the United States, the U.S. dollar was the world reserve currency, people could choose by themselves their own uh, currency they want to use. Uh, and that's why uh, we had different world reserve currency in the last 500 years. It's really well uh, described on the Ray Dalio book, uh, Changing World Order, something like that. But Ray Dalio's book is really, really interesting on that subject of uh changing world reserve currencies. Yeah, I think that's uh, a must read. Uh, if, if, if people don't want to read, he put out uh, also a really good video, like I think a 45 minutes or 50 yep. minute video on YouTube, which is really good. And I think after you saw that video on YouTube, you probably want to buy the book and, and, and see what's going on. Uh, it's one of those books that's not a Bitcoin book, but I think still really valuable uh, to read and, 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 and dive into. That's super interesting. Um, I, wow. I also uh, saw a little bit more about the Thaler thing. Uh, it's now in Czech a place. It was the Joachim's Thaler. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's it's now a place in, in Czech Republic. It's actually not that far away from, from Prague. Okay, uh, it's not in Germany. Sorry, it was a mountain in Czech Republic. So that's yeah, it, it, it's, okay. it was in Ger Germany, uh, oh. but now it's no, no longer in Germany. <laughs> okay, okay, that's why. <laughs> uh, oh. So that, that was that is super interesting. So like the, the origin is, is, is German. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I was yeah, may, maybe I'm a little bit too <laughs> fascinated by that because I was like dollar. Yeah, it's a US dollar. It comes from America. Like the, that's an, an American thing. No, but no it's the actually, word dollar is from Spain. I mean, the Spanish dollar was there before the US dollar. 
And it was actually the, the Spanish dollar was a, it was real, basically. It was eight real, re, real, I guess, in English. Uh, but I don't know. I don't know specifically why we call it Spanish dollar or some Sometimes it changed. It's called the dollar, and and their Americans uh, use that that same word because basically the Spanish dollar was the money of the U.S. The, well, the American continent uh, before they could mint their own money in 1792. So in 1792 they passed the law that uh, uh, created the U.S. dollar. They were able to mint their own coins, but before that they were basically using the Spanish dollars. Now the next, next a logical step for us to discuss is when uh, America and the big nations will adopt Bitcoin as a world reserve. <laughs> uh, Bitcoin, uh, uh, what, how does it, uh, the politicians in the US call it strategic reserve asset? I think it's the word they, hmm. they, they call it. Um, do you foresee that? Is that, is that the, the first step to Bitcoin being an actual world reserve asset uh, underlying of fiat? I, th I think it's it, with Bitcoin. The difference is that it starts with the individuals. That's that's the big thing here. Um, I think people will choose by themselves. Well, the people that are aware of all those facts that we just stated. <coughs> Sorry, they will choose uh, Bitcoin. They have an exit now that didn't really exist uh, in the fiat era. Basically, you were tied to your bank account and in your local money you could buy foreign money maybe you can you can forex you can, can trade some forex but if even if you use the more the safer one let's say the us dollar uh well you would get devalued by six to seven percent per year anyway so so that's why people invest and that's why people invest in uh houses and and uh and um sorry re real estate market that's just to protect themselves well Why houses are so expensive in Canada? Because people use uh, houses as a way to protect themselves from, from inflation. So that's what people used before they had uh, a new choice that, like, like, like Bitcoin. And it's bit, I mean, right now, Bitcoin, I don't think it's for everyone because you have to understand it. You have to have some technical knowledge. It's a bit challenging for, for some people to, to uh, self host, well, self, uh, have their, their coin on, on their own wallet with, with their own keys. I get that. Um, but to any people that understand inflation, understand the history of money and understand, uh, well, are, are tech savvy enough to, Uh, to have their own uh, custody of, of Bitcoin, that's the perfect answer for uh, in, in my in my head. So that 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 will start with the individual for sure. Then the countries. Well, any country that is dollarized, the choice is easy. I mean, you're already using a foreign currency that you don't control the um, the volume. Uh, in let's say it's it's a good idea for for a small country to use US dollar. Uh, to prevent inflation, that's a great idea. But the problem is the, that they get devaluated six or seven percent per year, and they don't get the free money. You know, in the United States, people get deval their their saving are, are devalued, but at least they get the money printing. You know, so there's it's a deal. Okay, your saving is devalued, but you get new money for 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 basically for free. So that's not a that's not a good deal but that's not a bad deal the better deal is that is if you get devalued and not get the fresh money so that's that's the choice of the countries that that, that get uh, that use um us dollar instead of their own fiat uh, currency uh, so i guess that those country could easily more easily have a strategic reserve in bitcoin to protect them from inflation uh, so it's, that's the second level i guess that those countries will it's a no-brainer they should they should acquire bitcoins and there are some countries we saw Bhutan, we saw el salvador uh, so and there's i guess there's an, some other country that do that but maybe they don't talk about it um and and also they can mine basically any country could mine with excess energy and have bitcoins and it would not cost anything to the population or the country right i mean if you have some energy um Uh, uh, energy plant that uh, is not fully used, and uh, that and that's the case. I mean, plants are planned for peak uh, periods, uh, so so there's a lot of, of time during the day that they are not um, at, at peak. So uh, at peak, um, um, they produce, but the the the, the grid doesn't um, uh, doesn't accept all the um, the energy. So they could mine and have a strategic reserve at that. 
And the last point here is the country with monetary um, with a monetary sovereignty. I guess it will be the last countries to uh, to adopt Bitcoin. Why? Because those countries have a lot of um, social programs because they have they are nanny states basically, and the only in one of the reason they are nanny states is because they can print money in their own. Uh, they can leverage debt in their own currency. So basically, they have some free money, so they can say yes to any demand from the the population and say, "Oh yeah, we're going to be in ninety states and pay for everything," and 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 they print money basically to pay all that. So they won't let that privilege go easily because, well, I have a perfect example for you, Venezuela. That's exactly what happened in Venezuela. So the idea of uh, of uh, what happened in Venezuela is super simple so there were there was co some company all companies that was keeping all the profit for them because they were private companies and I th i'm not sure it's chavez i guess so now there's maduro and before it was chavez so chavez says that saw that and say that's not fair they're keeping all the profit for themselves for the um, for 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 the owners that's bad We're going to nationalize that and keep the profit for us and and finance the our social program. Okay, good. They did that and it worked. They had uh, um, a lot of uh, uh, improvement in education. They they got they had great. Well, I'm not an expert at that, but I I know that it was working. They had social program, all that. It was working, and then the price of oil went down, and basically they're also their uh, their uh, the nationalized companies. We're not doing a great job as uh, uh, producing more oil because uh, they weren't investing enough in um, in repairing their their, uh, their their plants and all that. So there was some problem uh, of, of production. So less production and price of oil going down. They were not making uh, uh, enough money. Well, they were not making uh, as much money as they were. So uh, the programs, all the social programs, were still there. They needed that much money to run but their revenue were going down and you cannot adjust that if it's a private uh, company they can just uh, lay off people and you know uh, uh, you 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 cut you you make your cost go down and you can be saved but not social program you cannot just de you cannot just erase them they exist and you know people that work for the states they they work there for the whole life you cannot you cannot uh, you cannot cut their their job so basically what they end up to do is printing money to finance the sa the social program they created with the money from the oil and that's it uh, after when when they the they were not able to produce enough oil and profit to finance it they just financed it with money printing and they ended up with hyperinflation so that's it that's what happened in it's as simple as that what happened in venezuela It's it's super fascinating to to, to listen to this. We we already <laughs> what it's one hour mark. It's it's fascinating how, how quick we went there. So how many questions I still have? Um, but we, we will definitely do a second round on that. I think um, for for that episode, uh, it's it's great that we have like a, a beginning understanding of like what what inflation is, how it looked, some artifacts with that, some, some historical things. I, I I really learned a lot. Uh, the day that I. <laughs> have to process and and and, and get into um, now one question that every one of my guests gets um, with a different topic what can we learn from you now besides bitcoin and all those hyperinflation things what what, what else ca could we learn uh, from you uh, well i i study a lot of um, the history of money uh, i've read about I admit, maybe 30 30 40 books Uh, well, I think I've read close to a hundred books in the last four or five years. When I discovered Bitcoin, it, it made me like in a reading fen frenzy or something. I, I, I just wanted to know more about economics, history of money, inflation, hyperinflation. So I have some, a lot of notes. I have 60,000 words of notes, like 150 pages of note, uh, that I've, I've, I've took from every book I've read about money, economy, and uh, I've made them in order. And maybe someday we'll write a book about the history of money to compare um, basically the origin, the, the, the two different um, theor uh, theory, theories about the origin of money. And that's what, that's what I want to bring to the debate here. 
because there's two there's two uh, sides um, here. You have the people of the MMT, you no know, monetary uh, modern monetary theory, that say that money has always been credit. So money is uh, it's a government thing. It's like it's a it's it has to be owned by the government and it should be a monopoly. And uh, the the government should be able to create any money that it needs to uh, assess the needs of the population. That's their point. And the reason behind that is said that money has always been credit. And the other side is the the um, the. Uh, sorry, the um, people who think that money is a uh, like gold. Uh, sorry, it's a marchandise in French. I'm sorry, uh, co uh, commodity. Sorry, the commodity monetary uh, that 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 will say that anything that is not gold is credit. They're kind of right, but uh, I don't I don't agree because I think credit is money too because we use credit as money. We it's just a semantic thing for me. Credit can be money. Uh, not all money is credit, but credit can be money. So you have those two things there, and uh, I try to um, to to make one unified uh, theory uh, of that. And Lynn Alden, in his book Broken Money, did that uh, better than me, I guess, because I, I worked on that uh, about a year or two before she published her book. And our conclusion are similar. Uh, she says that basically money is just a ledger. And that's how you can uh, un uh, unify those two theories. But my, uh, my unification process uh, used the um, the monetary premium. So what I'm basically my theory is that gold is not worth is not good money because there's an intrinsic value or something. It's just because people trust that they're going to be able to exchange it later at a comparable price. Same with paper money. You know, it's just that people trust that they will be able to exchange it later at a comparable price. And the difference between the value of the paper and the value of the the value in the industry of gold, let's say like 10% of its value, let's say it's $3,000 per ounce, maybe $300 per ounce is, is is real use in industry. Well, the difference is just monetary premium. It's just that people think that gold is worth $3,000 per ounce because it's money. And it's the same thing for paper money. People think a $100 bill is worth $100 because they know they can exchange it later for $100 worth of goods. That's it. That Both are exactly the same for me. It's just that gold have little, little intrinsic value or utility value from the industry. And that's it. There's no way a rock is worth $3,000 per ounce. The only reason it's worth that is because it's rare and people know they will be able to exchange it for a comparable value later. So for me, both type of money, fiat or gold, is based on trust that you can exchange it later. I call that, well, it's not my term, but during my research, I came upon the term monetary premium. And that's how I explain uh, the similarities between uh, commodity money and credit money. So yeah, so basically I, I just answered your question uh, with the whole point that that's what I'm working right now uh, on a paper uh, to unify those two theories. I think, and that would be also great. Maybe, in, I don't know when, when this paper or book will be finished, like in half a year, year, two years or whatever. I think that would be also then a great point to have a second round with you and go deep into some topics because I think it's, it's really interesting. Uh, and I like the way how, how you look at things, not like black and white, but really like, uh, looking at things with a, just a logical human mind, which sometimes is missed in, in economic spheres. I feel like I, lo Thank I love you. that for a lot. Thank you. I appreciate that. Perfect. Then, yeah, um, we have an end routine in the podcast where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. And the last guest was a big MSTR guy, MicroStrategy, and he asked, will MicroStrategy be a trillion dollar company? <laughs> uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> of of, of uh, course. <laughs> is is Microsoft will be the first trillionaire? I guess. I guess so. I guess oh yeah, so. it's it's a hard race. Uh, Elon Musk and Michael Saylor. Uh, I mean, M M Elon Musk has to uh, discover Bitcoin also. Then maybe he he gets there first. <laughs> yep. Yeah, big competition there. Big competition, yeah. Uh, really cool, perfect. And before I let you go, where can people find you? Ask you questions, reach out to you. Uh, I'm on Twitter. Uh, it's at David Saint-Ange. So D-A-V-I-D-S-T-O-N-G-E. 
uh, I'm on Twitter. Uh, you can write, you can add me, you can write me. I answer uh, questions when, when I'm asked. And I, I, re I talked about um, my, my artifacts a lot. I talk about inflation, talk about uh, hyperinflation. I talk about Bitcoin. So uh, everyone is uh, welcome to follow me, to follow me. Absolutely, and I will also put your uh, Twitter in the description. Or if you are watching on, uh, if if you are one of those five people that watch the whole episode on Twitter, uh, you you can directly uh, click on it. Uh, and yeah, thank you so much for being on. Also, thank you so much for everyone who is uh, uh, joining, uh, what is watching and listening and is joining us today. As always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye bye.